Nearly a decade following the 1911 revolution, Sun Yat-sen realized that no true freedom from imperialism would occur until China and its people were fully developed. The keystone of Dr. Sun's program begins with the construction of the three major ports, the Great Northern Port near the city of Beijing, the Great Southern Port in Guangzhou, and the Great Eastern Port near the city of Shanghai. These are the pillars on which the rest of the rail system relies. To begin, let's start with the Great Northern Port, a newly created deep water port in the heart of Bohai Bay and the first northern port which would remain ice-free in the wintertime. From here, the entirety of the northern China rail system would branch out, connecting China's densely populated coastline to the virgin, uninhabited regions of western Mongolia, the frontier. As our port is a starting point to the sea, so the first trunk line will follow the Luan Valley to Dolanur, the gateway to the vast Mongolian prairie. From Dolanur, rail makes its way to the frontier, traveling over 2,000 miles, skirting the Great Gobi Desert to Uramochi, branching westward into the Tarim Basin and north to the frontier city of Ili, where China's rail system will connect with the rest of the Eurasian land bridge system, connecting Berlin to Baghdad to Beijing and Moscow to Shanghai, eliminating dependence on British sea dominance once and for all. From here, let's go to the Great Eastern Port, located in the Hanchao Bay just south of Chapu, near the city of Shanghai. Though rail lines in this area will follow the same principles as those of the northern rail system, extending from the Shanghai Port through China's terrain all the way to the frontier connecting with the Siberian lines, the major aspect taken up here will be that of China's water system. The Yangtze River, the longest river in all of China, the backbone of China's economy for thousands of years, originates in the Great Tibetan Plateau and empties into the Hanchao Bay near Shanghai, greening several thousand miles of China's most densely populated arable land in the process. The banks of the Yangtze River itself will be expanded with the construction of a new canal on either side. A dam will be constructed near three gorges to regulate the flow of the upper and lower Yangtze River and to halt the devastating flooding that has been China's sorrow for thousands of years. The development of China's Grand Canal, along with the construction of several new river and sea ports, New canals and water systems will facilitate a network of navigable waterways throughout central China. The last pillar of Dr. Sun's development program begins at the great southern port of Canton, whose location at the junction of three major navigable rivers makes it the gateway to over 3,000 square miles of the most fertile, productive soil in all of China. Despite its strategic significance, Canton's restoration as one of China's main industrial centers and its transformation into a seaport had been hindered in every possible way by the British Empire, who at the time controlled Hong Kong and wanted no competition to their dominance of maritime trade. The development of the southern region of China, sprouting from the great southern port, would be in complete opposition to Britain's imperial system. Trunk lines of rail would be the trailblazers of development, opening up the region's vast iron, coal, timber, agriculture, and mineral resources, ready to be harnessed by the creativity and will of man.
In his 1921, The International Development of China, Dr. Sun lays out a comprehensive program for the transformation of the Chinese territory and the harnessing of its vast resource and agro-industrial potential through the building of over 100,000 miles of rail, over 1 million miles of roads, the construction of new deep water ports, the improvement of old and construction of new canals, greatly needed water development projects, the construction of telegraph lines, new modern cities, large-scale iron, steel, and cement plants, and, most importantly, the colonization and harnessing of new frontiers in Mongolia, Manchuria, Xinjiang, Kokonur, and Tibet. Such a development corridor is the foundation for the growth of new, modern cities, connected through a network of intertwined rail and communication systems, built and serviced through the development of coal and ironworks for greater energy and industrial production, and fed through the creation of new agricultural lands, utilizing the most advanced machinery and farm practices. But most importantly, this internal development of China will not only create the conditions where more people can inhabit the land at a greater standard of living, it will open up China's greatest resource. The development of free, thinking, creative citizens. And that is the only internal improvement that can truly wipe out imperialism once and for all.